The ME2001 was, it came into service about, it was, it was designed in the mid 60s and was the first generation of broadcast colour cameras, and, which was a major rev revolution in television, obviously. You know, the advent of colour was, was a major event. And that what made it possible over the black and white cameras was the invention of a much smaller tube. Um, the black and white cameras had a, a long tube, an image orthicon tube that was about that long for, for one colour, black, you know, monochrome. And suddenly they produced a tube that was that long and they suddenly thought, well, we could make a camera that's, that's physically small enough to operate. And can I put the side up? And if you look inside, this was, there were different designs going out, and you talked about Dave and the, the Philips cameras, the Pi cameras later on. But they came up with a unique design uh, to make the camera as short as possible, uh, which was very important in restricted space in studios. So although it's big, it's front to back length compared with other cameras like the Philips which they had the lens bolted onto the front of the camera they took the view of this one we'll put all the t all the tubes the, the, there are two four tubes this camera had three colors red green blue and a luminance signal which gave you the black and white signal different to that one to Dave's one and they crushed it all at the back here and put all the boards the technical boards do you want to put the other side up Rex? on that so there are two tubes this side um, and it's the red and blue and round here you got the other two tubes the there. other two tubes there and all the technology and all the servos associated with the lens which is here uh, are, are round it and the reason for that is that rather than sticking the lens on the front they left a hole in the middle and the lens slid into the body of the camera to make it shorter and more manageable and um, we can demonstrate that if I hang on take, take, take this off, take off first probably easier right release that no, push up. <laughs> and, then the and if you, lens that's, that's the lens moved. package. Do you want to just lift it out? And, and you can it's see not there. exactly light. That's a huge, large piece of glass with the servos yeah. to yeah. drive the, the focus and the And zoom. as you can see, that the, that's the camera with a, a great hole in the middle. Okay, and that was a, that, that was that a was design, a it was a revolutionary design. design. And this is a gas operated head which operates of pressurised nitrogen against the weight of the camera. You take the lens out, the camera is lighter, this will shoot up. And uh, has this, so we, it's now rebalanced, so we've got, this is um, an old plover pedestal, which is almost still operational. And the whole idea is that it, 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 it moves effortlessly up, up and down. down. Um, the, on the, the studio ones, the focus con control, well, which is what this knob does, is, is the, the focus knob is, is built into the camera. Mm. Well, an outside broadcast, because you were often working further back, there was another pan bar this side, and there was a separate box for it, which sat here. Yeah. The other thing um, on, on outside broadcast was rigging the cameras, which you can imagine it's quite a lump. But it was normally carried, you can either get four people, it had handles that came out the side, front, um, and I see the front and rear. Both sides. Not rig, both sides. But as you appreciate, when you take the lens out, uh, all the gubbins, the, the technology of the camera, the tubes, the, the block, are all up this end. So this end was twice as heavy as that end. And they were and rigging in OBs, the, these would be carried up flights of stairs, um, dumped in lifts, carried on trolleys, uh, on a, a race metering or a football match, they would be, there was a lifting bag, a frame that, that clipped onto here, and they'd be hoisted up on blocks and tackles um, in a very, quite a crude manner. You got used to it, you know, it was what you had to do, you know, the lens, you'd, you'd take the lens take out, the lens, the lens out, would be in a yeah. box separately. So everything was, was boxed apart from the cameras. The cameras lived in, uh, the, the, there was, the scanner, obviously, but you had a, a, a cable tender that had all the heavy cable gear in it, and then you had what was known as the camera van, later known as the technical support vehicle, but we always knew it was the camera van, and it had side lockers in the side, and a tray pulled out, and the four cameras that were on your unit lived in those four side lockers. So between shows, they were bumped up and down the M1 or wherever we were going, um, and it's, a, you know, they were not designed for outside broadcast, really, they were a studio camera. And they, they had a hard life on OBs. They, they were bashed around the country, they got wet, they got cold, very cold or very hot. Um, but generally, they, they worked pretty well. You know, they, we had problems, but um, you normally fixed it. If they didn't work, then you had boxes of spare boards. I mean, um, 
as you you know, these, there's, there's lots of stuff in here. All these boards slide out, um, so you can you'd have spare sets of boards, but you had a, go a good supply of spare boards, that you, and you do it by process of um, fault so finding. You know, logical fault finding. That it, it, if you if you got up and the camera didn't work, it could be the ca the fault on the camera. It could be a faulty cable. And these cables, uh, again, the G101, which is a massive cable that had 101 connectors in it, with mains and all sorts of stuff going up it, um, were prone to, you know, they, they were rigged through fields, was dirt, uh, it could pour with rain, they got wet. And the, the biggest problems were cables, you know. And, and um, So the fault could be the camera, it could be the cable, or it could be something in the truck. And that was often a cause of much discussion the engineers would come out and say, it's not working, we think, change the cable. So you speak to the riggers and say, can we change the cable? And they'd say, oh, we did that last time and it wasn't the cable, it was the camera. You know, bring the camera back and test it. So there was discussion about where you went. But there was, it could be time, very time consuming, but you had a lot more time. There was much more lead time in rigging because you had more problems to deal with. Now get a camera out of the box, switch it on, and 10 minutes later you could record something and get decent pictures of it. That's the difference. The first major problem with the colour is you've got, especially on the M, you've got four tubes picking up, three picking up different colours and one just doing black and white. The first problem you've got to make sure is that all the, all the tubes, all the pictures from them, all exactly line up. So you're not getting sort of any fringes or you know, horizontal and vertical. <clears throat> now that was something that the en the engineers did. We we d we didn't. We just pointed it at a, a chart like this one here. <coughs> line up chart. Line up chart, and uh, <coughs> so then you could see where where all the with, with the grid. You could then they could then the, the engineers would then look at the cameras and would work out where they had to move the the tubes in order to get everything lined up on top of one another, so that you got a proper decent colour picture. Mm. Um, because of the need to get all these images on top of each other, this was the first generation of cameras which came with a zoom lens. There's no alternative to zoom lenses. Prior to that, in the black and white days, That's you'd right. have a turret with fixed focus lenses, uh, which were cheaper, obviously, but zooms to us were bloody hell. Well, you're looking, you're looking at, a, at a particular object, and so you've got to move zoom in, lens. find the yeah. focus, which is the other side. You've got the focus knob on this side, so you focus on what you're looking at. You're, generally speaking, especially on outside broadcast, you'd zoom in to the tightest, tightest um, point that you were going to do, set the focus, and then zoom out again. And uh, assuming the lens had been lined up properly, then it would retain its focus throughout the whole range. That is one of the, the most important processes you have to do on outside broadcast now, is making sure that the lens tracks, as the word is used. So throughout the whole range, it stays in focus when you set the focus uh, on the point you want to be looking at, so that when you zoom in, it doesn't suddenly all go there, out of focus and look horrible. <coughs> so that was what we did. We set it all up, and then you've got the, the zoom control. Uh, in your, normally, on British cameramen, it's normally in the left hand, because that's how it was in the studios. That was the pan bar. And the, zoom uh, the focus control on the right-hand side, which is, well, I'll show you around that one. It's probably quicker. Um, with the focus control there. This camera is... Principally the same as that, but we didn't have the four tubes. On this, we had three tubes using red, green, and blue. And from the red, green, and blue, we used to derive a luminance or black and white picture, which was the extra tube they had in that. And when it was, it's basically to produce something that you can transmit. They had to produce a black and white image and then you could colour television at the other end, fills in the detail that's been sent. But this one, it's all on one side, the works this end, it doesn't go round. As you can see, the lens hangs on the front, which is like most cameras are, well, all cameras are today, you know. Light comes in, split up just by the prism, split up into red, green, blue. The line-up procedure is much the same as Robin was describing. You've got the tube focus there and there. So you you, you look at the same charts. They're very similar but different. They just put, this is a much more robust device. This still didn't stop it breaking. Uh, we don't have the, on OBs, we don't have the four carrying handles on this. This body would come without the lens. The lens comes in another box. 
and the body travelled on each side on a stretcher. Where he strapped it into a little frame, two handles at the back, two at the front, and it was carried like that. And when you hoisted it up a rostrum, you used a carabiner, four clips, and just lifted it straight up. Whereas that would have to go in the lifting bag up a high rostrum. You didn't carry it up a ladder. <laughs> you know, it was all pulled up. They do the same thing. Zoom, normal. You would stick your thumb in there, zooms it in and out, and that one's your focus. They're basically the same. They did the same thing, but they just did it differently. And we were better than them, and they were better than us. <laughs> you know, it was a bit with a northern accent. <laughs> what do you mean, northern accent? <laughs> Friday night, you'd stick it all in the camera van. The camera van would drive off, and depending on what your rotor said, you'd meet it at Leeds United or Middlesbrough, do match of the day with the same things you'd been using in the studio the day before. Uh, do you rig it Saturday night? It would possibly go somewhere else. Of often we'd do a match of the day Saturday, good old days in... City Varieties leads. During it Sunday night, it'd go back in the van and it would appear in Dickinson Road Monday morning, well it'd go overnight, appear Monday morning and a different crew would come in and be rigging a studio programme. So th these worked a lot harder physically and they were a bit more robust luckily. So I think they wouldn't have stood the hammer to the same degree. Because they were basically a studio camera. These, yeah, you know, this was the all-purpose all multi-role combat camera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they did the same job. They weren't different. Uh, and the other thing sense. is they actually used the same cables, the same cables, yes, G1 right. and this murderous G1 And the restrictions Dave was talking about uh, of sporting events was the length of cable you could use. You, you, they said that 1,800 feet, but mm. you were very lucky if you got that. So it meant that, that the camera had to be, was limited in the distance from the truck. So if you're doing big events, you needed lots of trucks dotted around mini but you know, three or four cameras working into a truck, and then it would be radio linked back to the main scanner. And that happened on golf tournaments, and big, you know, Grand National is a good example. Um, well, motor events, racing like Silverstone. Motor and, racing would and, have... And your major events like State Up in Parliament, mm. the Royal Weddings, yes. all, yeah, that yeah, all these big, big things. That we you'd, did all of those, you know. You'd we have did, units you know. sort of bolted on. Mm. Mm. It was a lot more reliable than the black and white stuff we'd had before. Yeah, a lot more reliable. It was a progression. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, each generation's better. Yeah. The little things you've got there yeah. are better than these, which are. Yeah. You know. I, th I think the difference is if something like that breaks, you've had it because nobody knows. It, you know, you can't. There's no user. Fr it's not user friendly. You can't mend bits. But with these, you could take them to bits. You could take boards out. You could substitute other boards. When they did go wrong, you, there was a better chance you'd get them going again. Well, these are modular, darling. <laughs> yes. Well, well lighting, uh, these cameras, you notice the amount of light in here, were uh, much less sensitive. You, you were much, they, they were not very sensitive at all. It was probably less sensitive probably than the, the last black and white ones. I can't. Yes, they were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, because you've got all the filters. Because you've got filters, filters in the way. Yeah. You're know, you, you splitting light into three, light, or four, so, yeah. three or four directions. If you directions. think about it, the same light's going in there, but you're splitting it up and using quarters of it. Yeah. to light four different tubes yeah. and this one a bit better because we've only got three, three. tubes see the, yeah. so these were slightly more sensitive technically uh, outdoors was 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 better was, you know you better. god's light you, you, yeah. you yeah. did the best you could floodlit things were not too good because even with a lot of light they don't handle low light levels you know what's good to the eye a floodlit football match 40 years ago is not as bright as a floodlit football match is now, mm, and, that's right. and it'd it be quite hard work, especially the lenses weren't as good, so when you zoom in, they would tend to get darker and darker and darker the further down the bit of glass you got. Mm. So it's just all progression. Mm. They're more and better now. Yeah. All the bits are more yeah. better and they're more sensitive, yeah. so it works. And conversely, the other way around was that the director would be sat in his truck doing, say, a, a, a match at Wimbledon, and of course the light would be going quiet, slowly fading, and the engineers would be turning the brightness up on the cameras. So, so as far as the director was concerned, he was getting this, looking the same picture. He suddenly opened the door to go out, and he'd gone dark. Yeah. As the light goes down, they open the cameras up, um, maximum aperture, so the depth of field reduces. So it gives you it gives you problems because uh, holding is focus holding his focus is is um, somebody Very would move six feet and in, in, at sort of three in the afternoon it, it's minimal but at, at, at nine o'clock at night when it's getting dark or in a, in a floodlit situation uh, there's no depth of field so right. it, it makes your your focus more critical so your output is uh, you've, you've got to be 
on your bo on the ball. Right on the ball. Nobody likes soft shots, directors or cameras. But there was nothing we could do to improve them. You know, it's just a physical get on with fact. it. Yeah, yeah. But it's the skill of, of, of producing good shots for the director, warning them of things, you're the eyes and ears of the director. The, the most important thing to talk back on OB, certainly, it was much more um, subjective in studios, was the ability for the cameraman to speak. Obviously, we could hear the director, and that's very important. We can hear production talk back, we can hear program sound, you can react to what a commentator is saying. Uh, but also, if something's gone wrong or you've got a problem, it's very important you put the key down and you can tell the director or the engineers what the problem is. So two-way talk map was very important on OBs. You know, <laughs> that you can hear two conversations and understand them both. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it's a world of dejecting to both yeah. as well. The only difference yeah. is now we can't hear anything. <laughs> <as we do>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but living in a world of talk, it, it is a little strange world. I, came out, I, I started in studios, as most of us did. It's different in Manchester because you did both. But in London, I started in studios, did three years at the centre, which was great for learning the basics. And, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have missed it for anything. It was great fun. And I, but I always fancied uh, getting on the road. And I got an attachment for six months, and I never went back. And I had 38 years on no bees. And um, it was a, a breath of fresh air. The whole attitudes, the way, even the management, but the way you operated, it was more like a... It was more like, it was it's like the, the team arm. thing again. Sorry, yeah, it's, right. it's the team thing. It's the thing team again. thing. The variety of things you did from state funerals, weddings, uh, party conferences, um, uh, every sort of sporting event, because the BBC had the contracts for just about everything then, and now they've got them for oh, not nothing, much. Uh, but yeah. you know, you'd be doing cricket, football, gymnastics, uh, horse racing, motor racing, motorcycle racing, scrambles. First time we're doing, you know, a motocross, yes. which was yeah. a regular thing on Grandson. It was great fun, and little events, but they were, they were. It was a bit more seat of the pants generally, but it was great fun, and the variety of it was was the thing that really appealed to me. It's just fun to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. it's not an yeah. excuse. Yeah. It's just fun yeah. to do, and we yeah. still do the odd yeah. yeah. And you know, some yeah. of us are approaching seventy. And some of us are oh, seventy, yeah. but it <laughs> but doesn't I'm, matter. Yeah. As long yeah. as we can still do it, yeah. we would like to do it.